you look at the way China's conducting its monetary and fiscal policy, China's being almost Swiss-like. Reskilling and retraining is going to have to be a big part of the solution. But the second thing that we're going to need is a medium-term focus on actually investing in the jobs of tomorrow. All hospitality change, restaurant means restore, restore the soul of the people. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacroix. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Unorthodox economics. Turkey's president renews his demand for interest rate cuts, pushing the lira to a record low against the dollar. The world's largest meat producer, JBS, is struck by a major cyber attack. It says it is making significant progress to resolve the issue. And Sumi Amazon will no longer force customers to pursue claims against a group in arbitration. You can now go to a court of law. All the details this hour. So let's get straight to our top story in Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, renewed calls for lower interest rates, pushing the lira to a fresh low against the dollar, piling pressure on his central bank governor to ease policy despite high inflation. Erdogan holds the unorthodox belief that lower borrowing costs will help slow inflation, the opposite of what most central bankers believe. Now joining us to discuss all of this is Bloomberg senior editor Justin Kerrigan. Justin, great to have you on the program today. The lira hitting another record low. And this, once again, seems to be the Erdogan factor. Yes, Francine, good morning. Clearly, uh, this is what set it off. Erdogan is the trigger again of this uh, latest bout of lira weakness. Um, I think what's surprising here is not so much what he said, we've heard it so many times before, but the clarity and the candor with which he delivered this message that he is expecting the central bank to cut rates sometime in, in July and August. So giving a clear timeline for that, having spoken to Governor Cavicciolo, he said on a TV interview in Turkey, and that's really what's given the market such a fright and why we're seeing this uh, decline in, in the lira today. So what's in store for Turkey and the lira in coming weeks, Justin? How difficult is it to predict it? I think if Erdogan gets his way, and he uh, certainly has in the past, uh, you remember that he could, seems to continually remove incumbent central bankers and replace them with people who he perceives to be more favorable towards his views. He only replaced um, uh, the, the previous incumbent, I should say, in March. So Cavacciolo is a, a fairly recent arrival here. So he's putting the central bank governor under pressure to do what he wants, and that's to cut rates, to keep reviving the economy. But, of course, the expense here will be inflation. Inflation is running at 17 percent in Turkey, and the central bank's target is to get it down to 5 percent in 2023. That may be a couple of years away now, but that target seems ever and ever more distant. Um, Justin, if you look at exactly, I mean, what's the kind of relationship that the president now has with the central banker? I know there's been, you know, a lot of changes within the central bank. Who's in charge? Well, Erdogan is, is in charge, and this is the whole business in, in Turkey. It's the independence of the central bank that worries traders so much. So when Erdogan says, I want to see rates cut, I want to see the, the growth factor being given priority in Turkey, the market takes fright because ultimately, if the central bank chief does not follow that line, his job could be in peril. And quite clearly, we've seen that on several occasions in the past year where central bankers have been removed and the uh, Tur Turkey's financial situation, the lira inflation, is really none the better. Good growth figures in the latest growth figures, but it has been at the expense of the lira's value and ultimately the inflation picture. Justin, thank you so much. Our Bloomberg senior editor there, Justin Kerrigan, was the very latest on the Turkish lira. Now, coming up, after one of the largest downside misses on record, this Friday's U.S. jobs report will tell investors if the labor supply crunch was a one-off or something we'll have to live for with a couple of more months. We discuss all of that with Andrew Sheets. That's up next, and this is Bloomberg.
economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the focal point in the holiday shortened week in the U.S. will be, of course, the jobs report on Friday. With April data dramatically missing expectations by almost three quarters of a million, May's reading will be even more crucial. The payrolls data in the coming months will test whether the recent slowdown in hiring stemmed from Americans opting to receive unemployment benefits instead of seeking to get back to work, especially as more states opt out of the federal jobless benefits top up. Well, joining us now is Andrew Sheets. He's Morgan Stanley Chief Cross Asset Strategist. Andrew, as always, thank you so much for joining us. I know you have a really great part in your media outlook saying like now is the hard part, but what in terms of economics in the U.S. are you expecting with the jobs report on Friday? Yeah, good morning. Uh, thanks. Uh, so we expect a pretty good jobs report. Um, our economists are forecasting 650,000 jobs being created, which is right in line with consensus, but would be a strong bounce back from last month's disappointment. And you know, importantly, we do think last month's report was going to be more of an aberration. If we look at underlying economic trends in the U.S., we think they're strong. There is friction within the labor market, which is going to complicate the data over the summer. But ultimately, we do think the labor market will continue to heal and continue to improve over the coming months. What kind of an economy, Andrew, will we be left with? So, you, you know, the, the question I ask every time is, are we going to see real inflation? We seem to, to have signs also in the UK that it's picking up. We look at wage growth, of course, and whether there's a shortage of people being able to do the jobs, which is why inflation could pick up. But has your view on inflation changed at all? So we, we continue to think inflation will pick up. Now, I don't think that pickup will be dramatic. We're not talking about inflation that's 4 or 5%. It's, it's nothing like the 80s or the, the 70s. But I, I think you know a, a really important element of the coming years is just, I, I think, how different the underlying macroeconomic conditions look from the last decade. Um, and right, there's always a problem in markets of, of recency bias. I think all of us always kind of tend to ascribe what's going to happen in the future to kind of what's happened more recently. But you know, these are really different conditions. If I think about the last decade, you know, a decade of, of um, secular stagnation, you had you know fiscal austerity, you had very weak capital expenditures, you had a, you had a weak consumer. You know, looking ahead, we've got an enormous amount of fiscal stimulus, a very strong consumer. And our economists really see a booming capex cycle. So I think for all of those reasons, you know, very different conditions than we saw in the last decade argues for for different economic data. And I think you know higher core inflation over the coming two years is is a part of that story. Andrew, it, what are you reducing exposure to, given what you've just said? Well, I, I think what we believe is that this is going to be a hotter economic cycle and something like a, a star, if, if it burns hotter, it's going to burn for shorter. Um, and so we're going to be back to more normalized economic conditions a lot sooner. That means we're going to exit kind of an early cycle phase of the economic expansion a lot sooner than normal. And that means exiting kind of early cycle winners sooner than normal. And I think maybe at the top of that list or, or an important asset class within that is corporate credit. Um, the asset class is an amazing early cycle performer. It does its best risk adjusted return kind of in the teeth of a recession and coming out of one. Um, but credit's now quite expensive. And if we think we're going to get into a higher economic cycle, the, the the gains from further growth don't go to benefit the bondholder, but you know the risks of that hotter cycle, maybe being a shorter cycle, are still there. So we've downgraded credit. Uh, we've reduced it from an overweight to an equal weight. I think that's an area we'll continue to monitor as as a place that looks less attractive strategically. Um, and you know I think that that um, is is one of the key changes we've made recently. Is there anything in emerging markets fixed income, Andrew, that you find that you know you'd be looking at right now? Well, I, I think EM is is a tricky place to be honest, because you know, again, kind of similar to credit, EM is often a, a great early cycle performer. It, it in many cases does its best performance coming immediately out of a recession. We're obviously moving past that, and you know, this this hotter economic cycle, especially in the U.S., does pose some challenges to to emerging markets where. You know, we forecast the dollar to strengthen modestly over the next 12 months. I think that's uh, different from what a lot of investors expect, but that's our forecast. Um, and, you know, you do have this, this risk as, as U.S. interest rates, real interest rates in particular rise, that that's also uh, less favorable to EM fixed income. So it's another place that we'd probably rather be, be 
getting a little bit more cautious on than more positive on. Um, and in, you know, in contrast, we think, you know, Europe looks, looks pretty good, you know, in contrast, maybe the U.S. or emerging markets, you'll have central banks that, you know, can stay dovish for, for longer, less inflationary pressure and more attractive valuations. Andrew, um, is there anything, I mean, I don't know how you look at commodities. So they're, they're obviously like, you know, getting quite hot, but it's nothing like the super cycle, I guess we've seen in the past. Yeah, so I think commodities are are a couple of interesting stories coming together. You, you know, you had an asset class that had a really terrible decade, and so it's bouncing back from that. It's it's also an early cycle asset class that tends to do its best performance coming out of recession. So so that's been happening. And then you know, as you as you mentioned at the top, this story about inflation is is not going away. I think it's going to be with investors for for a long time. There, there are going to be a lot of segments on inflation over the next year and. Commodities are, are an asset class that's seen as a, an inflation hedge that often pays you a, a positive level of carry for uh, for holding that position, and, and that's also attractive. So you have all of those good factors. Now, the downside is that given how much commodity prices have increased, they're now above where we think real supply and demand can justify those prices. So, so we're currently neutral on commodities. We, we think the energy space is more attractive than the metals space. And we also think that, that levels of volatility um, are, are probably too high in some of the key commodities that's pricing in too wide of a range for something like oil, for example, when we actually think oil price appreciation is capped by a lot of excess supply out of OPEC, and then downside is capped by the fact that growth will be quite strong. Andrew, we're just getting a viewer question, and this is a viewer that writes in often, so thank you so much for paying so much attention to uh, what our great guests are saying. And this viewer, um, Andrew, is basically asking, how do demographics you know, differ from the 70s inflation that we saw in the United States? So does this play a major factor because of a U.S. population that's aging, for example? Yeah, so, so interestingly, I mean, I, I think you see quite different interpretations of how an aging population should affect inflation. So you have um, the 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 perspective of Japan, where an aging population has been uh, associated with disinflation, deflation. But then I think you can also argue that, that as a population ages, as people retire, they drop out of the labor force and they just become consumers. And, and that's a negative supply shock. That's an inflationary pressure. You've lost some labor supply, but you're keeping that spending demand. And so you know, I think there's a legitimate argument that an aging population is not necessarily disinflationary or, or deflationary. So it definitely lowers potential growth. Although I also think we need to keep in mind that overall demographic trends, while they're getting a little bit worse from a population growth standpoint, you know, you kind of have to squint at the chart to really tell the difference between now and, and 15 years ago. So you know, bottom line, we, we don't think that has a dramatic impact on the inflation debate. And there's a realistic case that it could actually be, you know, more inflationary than deflationary. I think the jury's still out on that. Andrew, thanks so much. Andrew Sheets of Morgan Stanley, chief cross-asset strategist, of course, stays with us. And we'll have plenty more on uh, currencies. And also we'll talk about the UK. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. OPEC Plus is sticking to its plan of monthly production increases until July, but refusing to give any hints about further moves until there's clear evidence of more demand. Ministers from the oil cartel agreed to press ahead with an 841,000 barrel a day hike in July. The IEA forecast global demand will jump by roughly 5 million barrels a day between now and the end of the year. Now, the World Health Organization has approved China's Sinovac COVID vaccine for emergency use. In a boost for countries scrambling for a supply of immunizations, the WHO has recommended its use for people aged 18 and older in a two-dose schedule with a spacing of two to four weeks between the shots. Sinovac has already shipped 380 million doses to countries and regions ranging from Hong Kong to Zimbabwe since late last year. The head of the Bank of Japan's Financial Markets Department has told us the country must accelerate efforts to prepare for a transition away from LIBOR. Akira Otani says the biggest risk for the switch is that some institutions may choose to save money by waiting to see what others actually do first.
We only have a month left to go for the transition date for new transactions. We're no longer at a stage to wonder whether it's doable or not. We're at the stage where we have to get it done. And Deutsche Bank is the latest company to launch a new remote working policy. In a memo seen by Bloomberg, the lender says it will allow staff to divide their work hours between home and the office. Deutsche has repeatedly highlighted it wants to cut costs by reducing office space. Earlier this year, it said a range of 40 to 60 percent of work from home does indeed make sense. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerrans. This is Bloomberg. Francine. Leanne, thanks so much. Now coming up, a Russia-linked hacking group targets the world's largest meat producer. We get the latest on that next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the world's largest meat producer has made significant progress to resolve a cyber attack that shut down a number of its global hubs. According to unions, the attack forced JBS to close all of its U.S. beef plants, disrupting output from facilities that provide almost a quarter of American supplies. Well, Bloomberg's Jamie Tarabay joins us, who covers cybersecurity. Jamie, what do we actually know about the attack so far? Well, what we do know is that it shut down, it forced the shutdown of all the beef plant facilities for JBS in the U.S. It took offline uh, the slaughter operations in Australia as well as in one of Canada's largest beef plants. So this has obviously had ramifications around the world uh, and impacted meat production and all the way down the supply line. Um, we understand that the group reportedly responsible for this attack um, is a Russian-linked group called Revil, and what they essentially do is uh, they offer ransomware as a service, and so uh, you could actually rent the, the malware, uh, install it in a company um, that then uh, sort of encrypts the data and you can steal it. They do a thing called double extortion where you're charged twice. You're charged to de-encrypt the data on your current systems and and you're also charged to have the data that was stolen returned to you without it being posted online and at risk for being, you know, stolen in terms of IP, et cetera. Um, you know, this isn't the first time that we've seen this reveal. The company, the group is also responsible for hacking Quanta, a Taiwanese hardware supplier that uh, recently uh, released blueprints for Apple devices just as Apple itself was making the announcement. So, you know, they've been doing quite a few different um, breaches and penetrations and demanding hefty sums of payment in return. Yeah, but Jamie, overall, I mean, are companies doing enough to actually protect themselves, you know, on, from these attacks? We all remember the pipeline. That was a huge concern. And now we have a, another pretty big company. Right. I mean, I think that every time we see one of these attacks, we see just how vulnerable a lot of the systems are. Like, just even since May last year, there have been more than 40 publicly reported ransomware attacks against food companies. So, uh, you know, this is it's it's not going to get any better and 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 most companies now whether they think that they're a traditional target or a non-traditional target they think they're safe from cyber attacks um, really need to start looking into what they're doing in terms of their own posture their own security their own prote protection oftentimes though and we, we've seen this repeatedly sometimes it could be something as simple as a spam email that gets clicked on and that's kind of an entry point so not only do companies need to start thinking about about beefing up their cybersecurity, there really needs to be sort of an element of um, education and training within within the companies themselves, because clearly the repercussions are pretty uh, pretty expensive. Jamie, thanks so much. Bloomberg's cybersecurity reporter there, Jamie Terabay. Now let's get back to Andrew Sheets, Morgan Stanley, Chief Cross Asset Strategy. Andrew, um, you know, without talking about cybersecurity, it also goes back to you know the the basically the fight the foreign policy. I guess you know some of uh, these uh, state-sponsored actors could be involved or they could not be involved, but something that the U.S. needs to keep an eye on. What do we know? Will that relations will be like between the U.S. and China? 
Well, look, I mean, I, I do think if we if we take a step back, you know, we we had a, a an environment where you know foreign policy considerations were really a dominant driver of, of the market debate for a lot of you know 20, 2018, 2019. and then obviously they they've kind of gone onto the back burner as as COVID hit, and, and you had a terrible global recession, and then everything was about how deep will that recession be? Can we recover? Can the vaccines work? And so. You know, I think as as the economic backdrop normalizes, it would be reasonable for the market to to refocus on some of these geopolitical questions that you know haven't haven't gone away. And you know, I think this question over um, U.S. China trade is is an open one. So far, there there appears to have been some some constructive signs uh, between the U.S. and China negotiators um, uh, in terms of uh, you know making making some progress there, or at least kind of starting off in a in a constructive way. But but, yep. you know, it's, it's too early to say. It's probably too early to say that. Andrew, thanks so much. Andrew Sheets there, Morgan Stanley, Chief Cross-Asset strategist, strategist. This is Bloomberg. Unorthodox economics, Turkey's president renews his demand for interest rate cuts, pushing the lira to a record low against the dollar. The world's largest meat producer, JBS, is struck by a major cyber attack. It says it's making significant progress to resolve the issue. And sue me, Amazon will no longer force customers to pursue claims against a group in arbitration. We can now go to a court of law. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francie Lacqua here in London. So, Alexa, call my lawyer. Well, Amazon will let customers sue after tens of thousands of people inundate the company with complaints that the Alexa digital assistant was improperly collecting voice recordings. Previously, customers had to pursue claims and arbitrations rather than a court of law. Well, joining us now with more is Bloomberg opinion columnist Alex Webb. Alex, first of all, I mean, I had no idea that actually an Amazon customer couldn't go to a court of law. So, you know, is this just peer pressure that they've changed their mind over arbitration? Uh, it's essentially, it's probably the cheaper option for them in a sense, because formally what would happen is that you would have to uh, file an arbitration claim. That was a fee that Amazon would stomach itself uh, according to its own terms and conditions. And if, what the, what's happened is this particular firm in Chicago, Keller Lenkner, managed to um, corral a bunch of people to file these claims. And they, they, they say there's 75,000 arbitration claims pertaining to Alexa. Each of those costs a few hundred dollars a piece just to file, and that clearly is, is a cost stretching to the tens of millions of dollars. Alex, so what are customers claiming? I know you've written extensively about this, and actually you've come on the program to talk about it. It's basically they're saying that Alexa's recording things that it shouldn't be recording. I guess I think it's the fact that people just aren't necessarily aware of what Alexa does record. You know, every time that Alexa thinks it hears its name being triggered, it will record the next three to five seconds or something. And if they, uh, if it doesn't carry out an action in particular, um, or it doesn't recognize or understand what it's supposed to be doing, it will send that recording, and this has been reported by our colleagues in Bloomberg News, it will send that recording to a center for Europe. It tends to be, I think, in Romania or in Eastern Europe. And someone will listen to that recording, work out what Alexa got wrong, and then it means that the next time it'll be able to do it. Now, of course, what has also happened then is that there were times where people weren't trying to say Alexa at all. They're trying to say something completely different, and those recordings are being sent off to places. And that's what's made people very uncomfortable, and that's what's um, you know, prompted some of, these, some of these claims. What has Amazon said in response to this, Alex? Well, um, Amazon, they didn't comment to, to Bloomberg, uh, but I, you know, ultimately this decision was kind of snuck into their changing terms and conditions. It wasn't as though Amazon made a big announcement, just in the, in the terms and conditions that people sign up to and agree to when they use Amazon's products and services, um, you know, buried on point whatever it is, 12.7.3, I've no idea, I just made that number up, but you know, deep in the T's and C's, Amazon made this change, and, and that's really what has, has, um, what has been noticed now by the Journal and our colleagues in, in uh, Seattle. 
Alex, thanks so much. Our Bloomberg opinion columnist, Alex Webb, there with the very latest on Amazon. Now let's get straight to the Bloomberg business flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. Bloomberg has learned that Mudrick Capital has sold all its stock in AMC. This comes after the movie theater chain disclosed that Mudrick had bought $230 million of fresh shares to bolster its finances the very same day. Sources tell us Mudrick no longer holds any AMC stock and disposed of its stake after concluding it was overvalued, propped up by a recent wave of day trading enthusiasm. Now, TSMC is moving forward with plans to build a $12 billion chip plant in Phoenix, Arizona. CEO CC Wei says construction is well underway months after the city approved financial incentives for the project. Governments around the world are looking to ramp up local chip production amid a continuing global squeeze. And finally, Zoom has given a sales forecast that topped analysts' estimates for the current quarter. Revenue in the period ending in July will be as much as $990 million, beating average forecasts of $942 million. The beat offers hope the company will be able to retain and add large customers, even as demand created by the pandemic does ease. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Francine. Leanne, thank you so much. Now, coming up, vaccination perks. HSBC gives its staff in Hong Kong two extra days off if they get a COVID vaccine. We discuss that next. This is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, as economies slowly reopen, many chief executives want their workers back in the office. The JP Morgan Asia Pacific chief executive struck a similar tone to his boss, Jamie Dimon, saying that he hopes to get people back into their Hong Kong headquarters. I like the idea of having more people back in the office, uh, especially where it's safe to do so. I think Hong Kong is one of those places where we can have more folks coming back mm. uh, in the office. Will the business go back to the way it used to be before, um, jumping on a plane, uh, as my wife used to say, just to get a coffee with a client? Probably not. Well, that was JP Morgan's Filippo Gori speaking to us exclusively at the Lenders China Summit. Now, let's bring in Danny Berger uh, for more on this conversation. Danny, first of all, the view from JP Morgan in, in Hong Kong is basically, you know, people have to get vaccinated, mm -hmm. otherwise Asia will fall behind other lenders or other banks in the region, rolling out employee perks if they get a vaccination. And HSBC is one of our top red stories about what they're doing to try to motivate people to get the, you know, the jab. Exactly. So HSBC, their motivation is if you get the vaccine, you get an extra two days off. It is pretty similar, actually, to what we've seen other banks in the region do. Standard Charter, for example, has done something really similar. And this does come after a call from the de facto central bank saying to businesses, look, you should follow the government's lead in doing this. Uh, it's not something we see happen here in London, in Europe, in the U.S., really. And, and part of the reason is just because your, uh, Asia is behind in a lot of regards to the vaccine. So, yes, U.S. lenders want their employees back in the office, but we haven't seen them go as far as this. I should say HSBC is, isn't even sort of the biggest perk that we've seen. There are some restaurants and other companies uh, who've just given their staff money, who've given them uh, a shopping spree uh, if they go ahead and get a vaccine. So the other story that you're obsessed with, Danny, I'm <laughs> obsessed, okay, is AMC. So, yeah. for, you know, for our international audience, first of all, this is a, basically a U.S. film uh, venue. Mm -hmm. It sold $250 million worth of shares to an investor and then sold out. And, and this is kind of like, it's not a really typical trade, is it? No, it, it is so unusual. I mean, this is the first time I've really seen anything that's similar to this. Um, it's Mudrick Capital that went in and bought that $230 million worth of shares. And yeah, as you say, after they buy it, they buy it at a premium. So people look at it and say, okay, that's good for that meme stock. Now AMC can go out, make more acquisitions, be more aggressive. So the shares rally. And in the middle of this rally and the whole lot of volume that it brings, sources tell Bloomberg that Mudrick sells out, telling its clients 
the shares are overvalued, which is, I mean, this huge sense of irony because they're overvalued when they bought them. They helped it create a rally and they say, okay, we're done. It's overvalued. So they make a really good profit here. Uh, AMC is now armed with more cash to do the deal. So both of them kind of winning out here. And AMC shares continuing to rally. They're up 25% pre-market. So no one is left holding the bag. So, so far, I mean, it seems like everyone has, has kind of won. But again, I don't think this would have been possible, Francine, if AMC weren't a meme stock and didn't have this huge vo uh, following that would allow the shares to rally after the sale. I mean, Stonks, is there anything that Elon Musk actually can't move, Danny? So it's all, he also tweeted about Baby Shark yeah. doo -doo -doo -doo, that we all now have in our head. And basically, it sent the producer or one of the shareholders and the producer of Baby Shark flying. Yeah, and, and um, it, this is one of my favorite phrases coined by Matt Levine, the Bloomberg Opinion columnist. It's EMH, so not efficient market hypothesis, but <laughs> Elon market hypothesis, <laughs> that anything that's in proximity to Elon Musk rallies in, hey, if it's Baby Shark, even that's going to rally. He was responding to a tweet that was a clip from South Park. I mean, it's, it's really just markets continue to be strange times, Francine. I, I just find <laughs> it amazing. I mean, does he tweet, move the markets, and then just has a beer? Well, you know, look into that. Or Danny Berger <laughs> there with some of these more unusual trades as well. Now, the U.S. and Chinese governments took another step towards restarting economic and trade talks with the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen and Vice Premier Liu He holding what they described as frank discussions in their first call. The two sides discussed how to support a continued strong economic recovery and the importance of cooperating on areas that are in U.S. interests while at the same time, frankly, tackling issues of concern. That's according to a statement from the U.S. Treasury. Now joining us is Esther Law Amundi, Senior Investment Manager for Emerging Market Debt. Esther, as always, thank you so much for joining us. I have a million questions on a lot of the emerging markets. But if you start on China, what's the U.S.-China relationship going to look like? Well, I think um, the fact that they have a neutral meeting yesterday, um, I take it as a, as a good sign especially compared with what happened at the beginning of the year where the tension was a little bit, um, I would say, deteriorated. Um, but going forward, I think China and U.S. always have their um, differences. But um, what, what I take comfort is also that they seem to be more aligned, not just with the U.S., but also globally on the, on the climate agenda. So I think these differences um, and, you know, working together initiative will go hand in hand. And hopefully there will be a, a, a balance going forward, which is more working in favor of global recovery. Esther, where do you see the, the best, if you look at emerging markets, I mean, we sometimes call, you know, emerging markets overall. Yesterday, we were speaking to Jim O'Neill, who also coined uh, the phrase break, but they're not all created equal. Where do you see the biggest value right now where you want to be invested in? So uh, in emerging markets, I think we are all, you know, aware of um, the global high yield, maybe putting pr some pressure, you know, on, on the emerging market debt. But for me, I think there's still value in the selective ports, especially in the high yield countries. Uh, I particularly like countries where you have a good, you know, let's say a, a good long term structural reforms, uh, uh, IMF anchor, good cash flows. So I will put Egypt being one of them, um, this uh, frontier, high yield, positive real yield countries. I still see, um, you know, they, they, the ability to uh, absorb more inflows from here. Esther, is, is the right way to look at, you know, do you have to look beyond COVID cases? Is there a danger that markets sell off because of COVID that, you know, of course, there's going to be horrific death. But, you know, apart from that, if we get the vaccinations quite quickly, a country could turn around its fortunes, you know, maybe faster than in the past. I think, you know, everyone is aware that or was aware that H1, was it H1? will be particularly difficult for emerging markets just because we know that the vaccines will only come to emerging markets after the developed worlds have had it or have left over. So we are kind of going through, um, I would say, the, the toughest patch at the moment. Um, however, I do think that there will be, um, you know, possible recovery. Okay, the recovery may not be even. We have to be mindful of the distribution of vaccines um, unevenly amongst different uh, EM countries. But I think it's fair to, um, to, to look for some recovery from here. Um, but mindful of some unevenness, some countries may be recovering a bit uh, you know, with a bit of a lag. 
Esther, when you look at, you know, depending, of course, on what happens with dollar and inflation, um, what will the, the the currencies or actually the bonds in emerging markets that will that are most at risk if there's a surprise out there that could lead to a policy mistake from the Fed or another big central bank? Yeah, I think going back to basics, um, the currencies which are the most, um, I would say, vulnerable will be the ones which have the twin deficits. So, uh, and also maybe more have a higher um, a positioning in, um, in in the pots right now. So I would I would put uh, some of the higher beta ones um, being more vulnerable. For example, uh, the Mexican peso, um, and in um, you know in Asia maybe Indonesia, that they may they may be um, prone to a bit more uh, correction or outflows. Should we see the like, let's say the Fed tightening than what is already priced in? Esther, what does you know? Where do you see the? Um, I don't know if there's something that's overvalued, over, overbought, but that you see risky right now that investors haven't quite figured it out. What are you most nervous about in emerging markets? Yeah, I think um, at the moment the um, the COVID risk, which you uh, you correctly highlighted, um, has been uh, overall. I think the markets are you know having a more optimistic view on that. Um, and second, secondly, obviously, is the, um, you know, if you like this uh, global tightening. Uh, right now, I think, um, you know, last, well, last week was a classic example when the tapering was first mentioned in the Fed minutes, um, the market was actually taking it quite well. So there's always a bit, I, I think, a bit of a tail risk, um, you know, has, has the market been a bit too sanguine about, you know, about the higher interest rate um, risk in the U.S. or the liquidity tightening. But Having said that, I think you know EM has also adjust, uh, adjusted um, with you know the higher US yield. It can be seen in the EM, uh, let's say uh, EM local currency real yield bonds versus the uh, DM real yield. So the, uh, I would say the spread is also reflecting that. Esther, I know in your note you also mentioned about the green transition. When will we fully know whether in some of the emerging markets, the, the, you know, the green transition will lead to sustainable growth with jobs and a, a better path ahead? Well, this is a very, um, I would say, a very uneven one at the moment, but we are very welcoming to see, you know, a pickup in the EM green issuance, um, especially in the past year. And all these, um, I would say, post-pandemic uh, plans have actually encouraged uh, more investments into green and also, you know, raising the ESG side. So that I think will be a slow process, you know, progress because ultimately they, they need the correct setup, you know, they have to have to have the right plans to, to be set up. So I think over the years, slowly but surely, right now um, in the EM world, uh, China is still by far the biggest uh, green bond issuance um, at this stage. Esther, thank you so much for all the insights. Esther Law there, Amundi Senior Investment Manager for Emerging Market Debt. Now coming up, as optimism for the UK's economic recovery grows, we'll look at the outlook for the FTSE for the rest of the year. That conversation is up next, and this is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the UK has seen a milestone in its path of the pandemic. For the first time since March, the country reported zero deaths yesterday. It's adding to optimism around the UK's economic recovery and hopes that the Prime Minister will push ahead with ending the final restrictions this month. But as the year goes on, what's the investment case for the UK? Well, joining us now is Tim Craighead. He's senior European equity strategist at Bloomberg Intelligence. Hi, Tim. So UK equities have underperformed European markets recently. Is this going to continue? Um, it's a great question, Francine. Uh, indeed, it seems a bit ironic on the surface that uh, the FTSE is not faring very well when you have all of this positive news that you just mentioned. Um, it's it's up 10 percent this year, but the rest of Europe is up something like 14 to 20 percent, and its relative multiple has now deflated to only about 75 percent of the euro stocks. Um, to us. 
this is an indication that the market is skeptical on the earnings recovery and how sustainable it is into 2022. We beg to differ. We think that it will last, and this takes us towards more of a, a cyclical value orientation. Um, and thankfully, those stocks are starting to come back uh, to life after taking a little bit of a pause to refresh, if you will, in April. Um, so we're, we're feeling pretty, pretty positive about the outlook. So what companies do you think are best positioned in the FTSE 100? Um, you know, Francine, we, we published a note that looks at 18 companies in particular that fall into three buckets, uh, if you will. The first one is, is cyclical leverage, looking at a, a post-pandemic economic recovery into next year. Um, and it's the, the cyclicals that you would think, the banks, the miners, energy, for example. Um, domestic travel is another. Um, a second bucket are those companies that have got something specific going on from self-help or restructuring. And there's quite a few who have taken pretty dramatic action. Um, BT, uh, Aviva, uh, Standard Life Aberdeen. Um, in many cases of these and others, there's new management who are really taking a, a different turn. And, and, and lastly, there's some good thematic ideas within the context of the FTSE where you've got um, 5G exposure, you've got what we call a, a green super cycle exposure. You know, think Glencore, think the telecoms. So there, there's plenty to look at within the FTSE. So uh, how much of a concern is recent pound strength for the FTSE? Yeah, um, you know, that's a, it's a, a big topic and it's, it's getting, it's sort of resurrecting again. You know, the, the, the pound is up to 141 on some of this positive news that you've talked about. And, and that is an issue, um, you know, a, a more than 60% of, of average revenue comes from abroad and that does create a constraint for the FTSE. It's a particular concern for some of the big heavyweight defensives. You know, you think like a Diageo or or a Unilever or a Glaxo. And what this does is refocus our attention on uh, three areas in particular. Cyclical companies that have got the cyclical wherewithal to sort of go beyond currency. Um, the domestic companies that tend to benefit from a stronger pound uh, as opposed to international companies. And, and thirdly are the smaller cap companies because those tend to be a combination of domestic oriented cyclical um, uh, 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 industry. And so, you know, it's sort of the best of both worlds. So inflation, of course, uh, Tim, one of the hot topic, I mean, the hot topic these days, how much of a concern is that for Europe? You know, um, if you look at, at the, the PPI and the CPI from a European perspective, it, it tends to be um, a little less of a concern than what we're seeing um, from a U.S. perspective. You know, it's there, but you know, actually, our work is 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 focusing in on the positive correlation that we have with margins uh, that are that are improving with pricing power. And you know, there there is a cyclical element again that that we think plays in favor when you've got a pro. Um, modest inflationary environment, sort of a best of both, sort of a Goldilocks scenario, put it that way. Um, and we think that's where we're at right now from a, from a European perspective or, or a, a UK perspective specifically. So we're not all that concerned as of yet. Well, thanks to uh, Tim Craighead, Senior European Equity Strategist for Bloomberg Intelligence. Now, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller joins me out of Berlin. Kaylee Lines out of New York. Of course, we'll have a full roundup of Fed speakers. I think there are about four or five later today. We'll look at market reaction, not only to that to inflation. We'll look at oil. We look at uh, Baby Shark, not something I say very often at 9.55 UK time. Baby Shark, up next, this is Bloomberg. I like the idea of having more people back in the office, uh, especially where it's safe to do so. This has been an extraordinarily productive year. We haven't really missed uh, much as a result of being out of the office. I think longer term, it has big impacts on the ability to train and recruit and retain uh, the best of our people. Employers, if they can, 
are going to use technology to increase productivity, and that should be an important offset. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix, Matt Miller, and Keely Lines. Well, good morning, everyone from London, Berlin, and New York. Our top stories today. Here's the beef. JBS bounces back from that cyber attack and plans to reopen almost all of its meat processing plants today. A Russia-linked hacker group is suspected. Inflation. What inflation? Turkey's president ignores rising prices and demands that central bank cut interest rates. The lira sinks to an all-time low. And the stock that has the experts scratching their heads. There's a new twist in the AMC saga and the shares just keep on rising. Kaylee, we have a funny day. I know we're also karaoke because there is a serious business story that actually sounds in production went out because of a Elon Musk tweet about baby sharks. So we're all over the stonks and actually, this, you know, we all have it in our head. Apologies to all the viewers that are now listening, uh, but there is a market angle to it. Yeah, there is. When Baby Shark becomes a market event, Francine, I think that's just evidence that 2021 <laughs> is one of the weirdest years we've had in yeah. a long time. Peak 2021. <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's get a recap of markets in Asia because this is where Baby Shark comes in. Broadly speaking, it was a mixed session. You did have stocks lower in Hong Kong and in China. A little bit of outperformance from the Nikkei, though, and actually your big outperformer was Australian equities, which were up more than 1% after stronger than expected GDP data. But the individual stock story of the day trades in South Korea and that is Samsung publishing it is the largest shareholder in the producer of baby shark do 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 Elon Musk tweeted about baby shark last night saying it quote crushes all and that sent the stock higher by as much as 10% so once again Elon Musk using his Twitter account to move asset prices I would also note in foreign exchange, uh, the Australian dollar is actually weaker against the U.S. dollar off the back of that GDP data. And of course, the Turkish lira at a record low against the U.S. dollar as President Erdogan once again says he wants lower interest rates. Of course, it is a broadly stronger dollar uh, in G10 this morning. And as far as other U.S. assets go, we did see a little bit of underperformance. Uh, performance for uh, large cap U.S. equities yesterday. And once again, they're struggling to find a footing this morning with uh, S&P E-minis down about two points. Nothing going on in the Treasury market. We're steady right at that 1.6 percent level. And then, of course, the big standout story yesterday was what happened with oil WTI climbing to the highest since the fall of 2018. That continues this morning. We're right above $68 a barrel. OPEC sounding bullish, plus no near term prospect of Iranian crude coming back onto the market with nuclear talks uh, slowing down that. Yeah, we'll continue to watch those talks in Vienna as well, see if mm -hmm. they wrap up with a new deal. I want to take a look at what's going on in European markets. Well, I hope something is going on in European markets. We do see some green here on the map, um, but not much. I guess the upside is that these are all new highs for some indexes for the continent. We're looking at all new highs on the DAX. We're looking at all new highs on the CAC. Not so on the FTSE, but the FTSE seems to be climbing by the most today of the European plus UK indexes. Um, you can see a gain right now about two tenths of 1%. Other indexes aren't really doing very much. The euro is down, as is the pound. The dollar showing a little bit of strength today. And I think traders not only here, uh, not only there in the U.S., but also here in Europe are waiting for the non-farm payrolls data to really lay down any bets because there's a tug of war between, you know, strong growth and the reopening trade or strong inflation and the Fed taper. And without that data, we really don't know where to go. Although, Fran, as you say, we have a lot of Fed speakers today, so we could get some direction. Yeah, we do. Have, I just wanted you to sing Baby Shark to me. I can't believe Kaylee got their first. No, night. please. There are a lot <laughs> I don't know why that's a story. Horrible, horrible, horrible song. Because actually Elon Musk tweets, it got 8 billion views and then the price soared. This is an I mean, eye roll. It, it is pretty extraordinary. <laughs> I like I don't think the move, the face doesn't move when there's an eye roll. It's more like, you know, that look. Um, <laughs> there's a lot going on, Matt, in the markets. And of course, it's not only about the Fed speakers, although here's who's speaking. Regional Fed presidents, first of all, Patrick Harker, Charles Evans, Raphael Bostic, and Robert Kaplan all participate in a forum on racism and the economy hosted by the Minneapolis Fed. The Fed also releases its beige book this afternoon. That could be a big one. The St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, also known as BEEF, begins with the Russian president, Vladimir Putin, giving the keynote speech. Then the Fed chair, 
Governor Jay Powell, ECB President Christine Lagarde, and the former BOE Governor Mark Carney all participated in the virtual Green Swan Conference on Climate and Finance. And finally, the, ECB's will pub the ECB will publish a report on the international role of the euro and that's interesting because it will also talk about uh, you know digital technology and maybe they'll touch on digital one now the world's largest meat producer has made significant progress to resolve a cyber attack that shut down a number of its global hubs according to unions the attack forced jbs to close all of its u.s beef plants disrupting output from facilities that provide almost a quarter of american supplies let's get more from our bloomberg cybersecurity reporter jamie terabay jamie first of all i mean you know first it started with the pipeline now it's beef it's like you know they're almost going after the fourth of july what do we know about this cyber attack look i mean Francine, i think you're right it's because it's it's we're definitely seeing a shift in the targeting of a lot of uh, i guess you know when we talk about supply chains and food and critical infrastructure and critical supplies, um, specifically about JPS, as you said, uh, the CEO has sort of made noises that the vast majority of the plants will be operational on Wednesday. We know that the attack really happened over the weekend, and it didn't just sort of impact the JBS beef plants in the U.S. It also shut down slaughter operations in Australia, and it took off uh, one of Canada's largest beef plants completely offline. Um, we don't have a lot of details yet on the ransom, but we do know so far that a Russian-linked group called Revil is said to be responsible. Um, this group essentially traffics in what we know as ransomware as a service, where you can actually partner with them to target a company and put in, execute the malware that essentially paralyzes the IT network. They will then charge you uh, dub doubly, like twice, to, to return the stolen data and to de-encrypt the data on your system that they have uh, basically made completely unattainable for you. This isn't the first big hack we've seen from Revil. Uh, they've also claimed credit for hacking Quanta for their Apple designs, which they then released mm. uh, online. And, you know, I mean, I just think that we're going to see more of these things as we go forward. You know, at least in the last 12 months, at least 40 food companies have experienced a cyber attack of some kind. And, well, and a lot of them have paid the ransom. I think that's the key part of the story, Jamie. And as you point out, we don't know yet if uh, JBS paid the ransom, but it's a fairly lucrative business. If businesses are going to pay, um, then hackers are clearly going to keep doing it and um, get rich. Bloomberg cybersecurity reporter Jamie Tarabay at the forefront of these stories for us. Let's move to uh, currency now. Turkey's president Recep Tayyip Erdogan has renewed calls for lower interest rates, and that's, that's pushed the lira to a fresh low against the dollar amid pressure on the central bank to ease policy despite high inflation. We get more from Bloomberg chief EM economist Ziad Dowd in Dubai. Ziad? Good morning, Matt. So basically, Mr. Erdogan uh, has set a time for the next rate hike in Turkey. He suggested that, so a rate cut. So he suggested that a rate cut could happen in either July or August. And his comments basically add another headwind to the to the to the. Uh, Turkish lira, which is already facing headwinds from three different sources. The first source is investor sentiment, which has turned against the currency in March after the firing of former central bank governor. That turn in sentiment turned the Turkish lira from one of the best performing emerging market currency to one of the worst performing ones today. The second headwind is Turkish inflation, which is running at three times the central bank's target. And a recent hike in domestic fuel prices Falling currency both mean that inflation will likely remain high in the coming months. And the third headwind is the global environment, where we have higher oil, high, higher oil prices that will probably rise, um, higher global inflation, which will probably tighten financial conditions globally, and both of these will weigh on the lira. So you have the, these three headwinds, Mr. Erdogan's comments, and they all mean basically that the outlook for the Turkish lira does not look that promising, and the lira could be in for another dramatic summer this year. Potentially more depreciation to come. Thank you very much to Bloomberg Chief EM Economist Dia Daoud in Dubai. And another twist in AMC's wild rally. The movie theater chain announced yesterday that it had sold $230 million worth of shares to Mudrick Capital. Then sources tell Bloomberg that Mudrick then promptly dumped them for a profit. Let's get more now from Bloomberg's Danny Berger. Danny, they're saying the stock is overvalued, and yet the meme traders don't seem to care. 
Yeah, I mean, they said the stock was overvalued, but still they bought $230 million worth of it at a premium. I mean, look, usually if someone goes in the market, buys new shares, the kind of price negotiation, they'd probably pay a discount, especially for a stock as volatile as, as AMC. So you have to give it to Mudrick. I mean, this was kind of a, a genius trade in terms they go in, they pay a lot of money for these shares. People look at it, they say, okay, that's good for AMC. Now AMC is newly equipped with all of this money to have a more aggressive strategy. Meme traders love the stock. It goes higher yesterday by more than 20%. And Mudrick, sources tell us, can cash out. And as you say, told clients that they thought the stock was overvalued. I mean, this is so unusual. I, I truly cannot think of an instance where this has happened before. And you'd have to imagine it wouldn't be able to happen if it were not for the volatility and just the big following that AMC has. More unusual, Danny, than Baby Shark. Actually, Matt has told me he'll walk off set if I sing again. <laughs> so. I, I, it's already stuck in my head. You guys have already done it. It's already stuck in my head. I hear Oh, it. no. No. Uh, <laughs> okay, so it's been seen. Uh, this, this is, this is going to be the rest of my day is Danny, ruined. This, this video is <laughs> has been seen 8 billion times, apparently. The most yep. watched on YouTube. But actually, by, just by tweeting about it, the stock price of the biggest shareholder and the producer soared. Yes, exactly. So, uh, 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 so one of the second biggest uh, shareholders of Baby Shark. I can't believe I have to talk over this song right now because I it's it's forever going to be stuck in my head. <laughs> so, okay, Elon Musk tweets about it, but to be clear, when he tweeted about it, he was responding to a tweet from South Park. Uh, it was a South Park clip about meme battle, like battling of the memes, who's going to last? And he's like, "Oh, Baby Shark beats all humans." That's the tweet that got Samsung Publishing rising higher in Asia trading because they own a big stake in the publisher. And this goes back to the brilliant Matt Levine's Elon Markets Hypothesis, EMH, forget efficient markets. It's all about Elon. Anything he touches, anything he talks about will rally. All right, Bloomberg's Danny Berger, thank you. And kudos to you for being able to do a hit on this show <laughs> while watching uh, children clap their hands together like a shark. All right, now let's take a look at some stocks moving in free market trading here in the U.S. Of course, AMC, one meme stock we have to take note of. The other one is GameStop. It rallied 12% yesterday. That continues this morning. Shares up 5%. Reddit traders still very active. I wonder if they're listening to Baby Shark while making some of these trades. Another stock moving to the upside is Tilray, the cannabis company, up about 1.3 percent and this is after Amazon said it will throw its support behind efforts to get uh, cannabis legalized at the federal level here in the U.S. And then I also want to note Coinbase also moving to the upside. It say, says it's going to offer Dogecoin uh, on uh, Coinbase starting tomorrow, June 3rd at 12 p.m. Eastern time if liquidity conditions are met. So potentially some more Elon Musk's uh, tweets about Dogecoin potentially coming in addition to Baby, Mu uh, Baby Musk. I guess we could make a Baby there. Musk song, Francine. <laughs> baby Shark, Baby that, Musk. That would be a great NFT, actually. I'm, <laughs> I'm uh, trying to figure out the, the 10 most annoying songs of all time. And I see there's Alvin and the Chipmunks. I'd like to move it, apparently, at number three. Coming up, Eric Nielsen. I don't think he'll talk about Baby Shark. Maybe there's something to do with inflation and Baby Shark. Unicredit Group Chief Economist joins us. And then later today, Jeff Curry, Goldman Sachs Global Head of Commodities Research. That's at 11.30 a.m. in New York, 4.30 p.m. in London. And this is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Matt Miller in Berlin, Kaylee Lyons in New York. Now let's uh, get straight to Eric Nielsen. I know, Matt, you had some really great charts to look at for Eric Nielsen. I don't know whether we want to start inflation, beige book, but he is Unicredit Group Chief Economist. Eric, thank you so much for joining us. I know yeah. you're the ever optimistic uh, person on Europe, but when you look at the U.S., we'll have an indication by the end of the week exactly how healthy the U.S. economy is or isn't. What's your take on, you know, inflation? Is there really a danger that, that we have sticky inflation that stays for longer? No, I think the, 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 uh, the probability of this is very low still. Uh, we are going through a period of, of uh, bottlenecks and all the other things we have talked about, but the un output gaps, I think, are still uh, so wide and, and unlikely to close. And even if they close, you have to assume that the Phillips curve starts to, so the relationship between unemployment and wages start to move, which you haven't done for two decades or thereabouts. So I think 
the, the outlook for a sort of underlying inflation over the next, beyond the next six, nine months in a, in a more fundamental way, both in America, but particularly in Europe, I think are still very low. We, you know, everyone I talk to who runs a company that sells stuff, Eric says, he's raising prices, whether it's Daimler or BMW, Siemens, Volkswagen, they're all raising prices beyond just higher input costs, right? They're padding margins as well right now. Uh, and it doesn't seem like those are the kind of prices that can be reversed later on. So, you know, I don't understand how this is transitory if we see that growth as well as wage growth. I mean, none of that goes back down. Well, Matt, then let's start by concluding the easiest thing for our, use, uh, our viewers is, is you should buy stocks, right, in these type of companies. Uh, because, they, as you said, they pat their, 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 their profits. Uh, and I think that is true. However, the, the key issue here is that we are seeing very big relative price changes. We saw this big shift through the pandemic uh, where people couldn't go out and buy cars and they couldn't go to the restaurants, they couldn't travel, but they could buy refrigerators and, and other doable goods at home. So you saw this big shift. And that shift is now reversing somewhat. And that, of course, comes with price changes in some of these sectors. So you haven't, I assume, then talked to people who, buy, who, who produce clothes, for example, non-branded clothes. Prices are down tremendously. Uh, if you see some of the, the airfares, the offers you get now, they're very good indeed, although they may not fly when you think they'll fly still. So there's a, my point is there's very big relative price changes. Uh, and for a period of time, six, nine months or thereabout, that is almost certainly going to lift the average index up some, but I doubt it will be beyond that. Eric, what about the labor side of this equation? Because you have supply shortages in terms of materials, but also in terms of labor. And that was evident once again in the ISM yeah. manufacturing data here in the U.S. yesterday. What does that spell for the payrolls report on Friday? Yeah, so this is a really interesting point that I, I and I don't have my head fully around it. We see it also in Europe, but particularly in America, we have very good numbers on this strange thing that you have very high unemployment numbers historically. And you have enough, a lot of data that shows that you, you basically can't, in, in sectors, can't find employment. Here in London, for example, you have restaurants who haven't opened yet for, because they can't find staff. The same thing I think, Matt, in Berlin, I saw from my friends there, that there's a, there's a lot of, of, of bottlenecks. Again, people don't move around. There is this big issue which worries me a bit, which is that statistically, uh, the, the, uh, these type of, of, of uh, mismatches come after you have had a longer period of, of longer term unemployed. So as you've been unemployed for a longer time, people may, I mean, young people may move back home, they're not available for the restaurants or that they have lost their skills. So that could be a longer term problem. More likely, I think it is just that a lot of the, the, the places where you rehire now in restaurants and in travel are these places where we are very close proximity to people and, and people are a bit scared still. Young people are still not uh, in, on the continent, certainly vaccinated. Not everywhere in America either. So, you, so I think there's a little bit of that uh, concern, along with the fact that, particularly in America, that you have very, have had very high payout cash from the government. So the trade-off you can afford not to to search as hard. Uh, that should adjust itself over some months. Eric, I have to ask you because it's also the uh, Italian Republic Day, La Festa della Repubblica. Um, yes. If you look at, you know, some of these southern countries in Europe, they're expecting the money from the EU to come any moment now. You know, given the plans some. that they've submitted, will it be enough to actually turn around the fortunes of some of these countries? Well, first of all, happy happy National Day, uh, Francine. It's, uh, it's, uh, they're all celebrating my colleagues also back in Milan. Um, <laughs> We don't know, right, if it's enough, but I can say this, this is the most ambitious and best designed program I've seen in Europe for, a, for in, as long as I watched Europe, right? It is a, it's massive and it is financed I mean, by Europe to a very large extent. Uh, we have cleaned up a lot of the, the issues along the way in terms of the bureaucracy and, and put some decent controls as far as I can judge on. Judge, it, it is, it's too early to tell, I mean, who knows? But, but uh, the one thing I, I, I really don't think is right to say is that, that it can't be done or, or it's not worth it or money will be, be wasted. Yes, there will be some money wasted here and there in every country when you do big things. But Italy desperately needed this type of, of, of approach of big policy reforms, big investments. Yeah. And, uh, and I think this is the best chance you have. 
Eric, thanks so much. Eric Nielsen, their Unicredit Group Chief Economist. We'll have plenty more, of course, on these markets. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacan, London, Matt Miller in Berlin, Kaylee Lines in New York. Now, how do you keep working from home when the boss wants you back in the office? Now, the new Bloomberg Business Week has a few points to keep in mind, manage expectations and perceptions. One way to do that is to spend 10 to 15 minutes answering important messages first thing in the morning. That creates a perception you're always responsive. Also provide frequent progress reports. It shows your colleagues what you're getting done. The trick is to keep these reports concise. Uh, find a time for feedback. Make sure you are your boss's schedule on a regular basis and finally set clear goals and metrics and then manage them. I mean, it seems like a lot to get through. I don't know if it flies with all bosses. Yeah, I don't. I think it would be difficult if you have a <laughs> boss like ours who works from like 3 a.m. <laughs> until 7 p.m. Um, but maybe worth it because working from home is pretty cool. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacquer in London, Matt Miller in Berlin, Kaylee Lyons in New York. Now, Matt, there is quite a lot going on, especially later with a lot of Fed speakers, and then we have the Beige Book, and of course, later this week, we have a health check on the U.S. economy. Yeah, it's really all about the Fed and its reaction to what we see on the non-farm payrolls side of things, especially the wages. I think are going to be really important because we want to see if there's any inflation. Right now, there's a tug of war in markets between the reopening trade, which is huge. We all live it. We all love it. And rising prices, which you wouldn't love so much if we really see it. And if they're here to stay, then the Fed has to do something about that. And that's what worries markets. Yeah, it certainly is. So, Kaylee, how's it playing today in the markets? Well, it depends on what side of the Atlantic you are on, Francine, because in Europe, it's a pretty positive day. You have the stock 600 actually at a fresh record high, only up about two tenths of one percent, but still an all time high here in the U.S. futures struggling to gain any kind of footing right now. We're essentially flat on S&P E-minis, not even down a point at this point. We'll see what happens come the opening bell in about four hours time in the Treasury market. Also, not much to note. We're essentially unchanged. We're just shy of one point six one percent on the U.S. 10 year yield. But of course, in the commodity complex, we continue to watch oil. You have OPEC sounding bullish on the demand side. On the supply side, maybe not more Iranian crude coming onto the market eminently. That is help lifting oil again today after a big rally yesterday. Brent crude now is approaching $71 a barrel. It hasn't held above that 70 level for a sustained period since 2019, but maybe it's the start uh, here in 2021. As for what some stocks are doing in pre-market trading here in the U.S., we have to note the meme stocks. AMC up another 30 percent in pre-market trading. Forget about Mudrick Capital selling its entire stake in the company because shares are overvalued. Traders really don't seem to care. You also have GameStop higher by about 4.6 percent. And a few other stories to note, one being Zoom video communications reported after the bell last night, beat in the first quarter, solid forecast. Maybe we will all still be using Zoom calls uh, even as we return to offices across the world. And then, of course, we do have Bitcoin moving to the upside. I haven't even mentioned crypto yet today. Half an hour into a show. That feels pretty unusual. It is moving higher, though, and some crypto tied stocks doing so in pre-market trading with Marathon Digital up the better part of 3%, Matt. Yeah, you don't see, uh, I mean, Bitcoin up, but you don't really see it moving that much. And I think it has floated a little bit mm -hmm. out of focus right now. I have a fantastic chart. And I think one of our most talented market watchers out of Hong Kong, David Inglis put this together. I'm not sure, but I think this is a chart that I got from David Inglis. For our listeners on Bloomberg Radio, I will walk you through it. It's two panels. The top panel is global market cap, and this is really why it's interesting. We're getting closer and closer to a milestone. Of course, global stocks have been going up, 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 but we're almost looking at $120 trillion in market cap. That's more than President Biden's budget. So it's huge. On the bottom panel, we see central bank balance sheets. Uh, right now, they continue to, I mean, obviously, they've been climbing as well since the great financial crisis, but the climb has been accelerated of late. It's not enough, though, to worry investors. And I think, Francine, that's why it's 
So interesting to watch. Global market cap getting closer and closer to $120 trillion. Yeah, and maybe the hard work for investment managers will be the second half of the year. So let's get straight to Laurie Heinel, State Street Global Advisors, Global Chief Investment Officer. Laurie, is most of the you know encouraging news already priced in? And good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, you know, a lot of it is priced in, and we've been a bit more cautious overall on the second half of the year. But we do think that the reflation trade continues, and we're seeing that in a lot of markets. And we're also starting to think about rebalancing, because even though certain parts of the market, like U.S. equities, have run pretty hot pretty quickly, other parts of the market, like European stocks, while they're doing well, there's still quite a bit of gap in valuation there. So we've started to reposition a bit more towards Europe, because we think that that might be a little bit better place to be positioned for the second half. Lori, is there a danger that actually a lot of the margins, though, in Europe will get squeezed like the rest of the world? Well, certainly that's a danger period, and that's something that I think we're watching very carefully as you think about commodities prices, as you think about labor markets, et cetera. Uh, the idea that uh, pro corporate profits are going to suffer is certainly something you have to be concerned about. Uh, but we think that the top line growth will be significant enough uh, to offset that and lead to uh, you know, additional incremental gains on stocks from here. How do you view inflation, Lori? We're going to get the wages number out on Friday. I'm watching it very closely because I've talked with so many business owners who say they can't get people to come in and work for them. They've got to raise wages if they want to pay more than unemployment benefits. You know, there are so many different cross trends on the whole inflation conundrum right now that it's hard to define how much of this really is transient and how much of it is going to be longer term. And certainly our current view is that we're with the Fed, that these are transient forces, that once the government benefits run out, you'll start to have you know, looser labor markets. And there are some underlying reasons to think that labor markets will improve overall as well. The problem is inflation expectations, and we still don't know the extent and the duration of the recovery because there is a lot of pent up demand. You've had some you know, bottlenecks in the supply chains. And once you start to get uh, inflation expectations getting set higher, there is a fear that the Fed will fall behind. So we think that the risks are rising, that inflation may be something more than just a transitory force. What do you tell clients, Lori, who want to know uh, which assets they need to hedge inflation? <laughs> Well, certainly equities remain pretty good. If you look at uh, historical performance of equities, as long as inflation doesn't really break out of that 4% plus kind of a range, equities tend to be okay. And so it's more a question of which companies may have better pricing power and so they can pass on those uh, price increases to consumers. And so it's a bit more discriminating amongst companies versus getting out of equities completely. And then obviously things like commodities and potentially even gold could be good inflation diversifiers. What does this all mean for the Fed, Lori? What's your base case on when tapering is going to start? So we still think that it's a 2022 and beyond story, and likely the first move will be reduction in some of the asset purchases. You talked earlier about you know, market capitalization and Fed balance sheets, et cetera. And so there's a lot that they can do just in terms of pulling away from markets. Uh, but we still think that it's more like a late 2022 before they start to think about interest rate increases. But given what we've just been talking about and what we've been seeing in terms of the risks, there is a possibility they have to pull that forward. The one thing I would say, though, is it's likely they'll be very deliberative about how they communicate that to markets so, so as not to create a bit of a, a scare in that regard. Lori, you talk about risks. Are there greater ones to the upside or downside right now? Yeah. Well, you know, that's a bit of a mixed bag. I think you have to say there are greater risks to the downside, just given lofty valuations here. And we saw even earlier this year, you know, bond prices move pretty sharply against a backdrop of potential higher inflation and the concerns that that created and rippled across markets. So you have to say that the risks are greater to the downside. Having said that, there are certain places, and I just talked about Europe a minute ago, where there may actually be risks to the upside that, were, that are underappreciated by the markets. Is there anything, Lori, that you're specifically reducing exposure to because of the next six months? Yeah. Yeah. So we've actually taken some uh, money off the table in uh, Asia, where we thought there again, some of the risk reward just was not priced in. And we started to pair back uh, earlier in the year, we were actually short duration. Uh, so we don't think that uh, rates are going to you know, sort of reach the levels that we saw earlier this year. So we've been a bit more neutral on duration. And we've taken a little bit off the table in terms of credit, though, because of spread tightening. I wonder what you look, uh, what you see when you look at um, the ECB and um, rates here. How do you see bonds progressing throughout the year? 
Well, most likely to be somewhat anchored, but probably, if anything, the move is higher. And again, that is against a backdrop, certainly, of uh, re more reopening, uh, better pick up in economic activity, but also more tolerance for fiscal spending. So I think one of the big stories out of Europe is that some of the taboos have been broken, and it remains to be seen where we go from here, but that benefits the peripheral countries more than sort of the Northern European countries. So on balance, uh, you know, more concerns about uh, inflation, you know, rising, but also perhaps more pressure on central banks, and as fiscal takes over, less pressure on them to retain those absolute uh, low rates. Lori, I want to talk about some more peculiar market phenomena. We had overnight Elon Musk tweeting about Baby Shark, and that moved asset prices in South Korea. You have AMC higher for, by 165% in just the last six sessions, and once again gaining in pre-market trading. You have crypto, really, anywhere you look. What does this behavior signal to you about where we are in these markets? Look, there's definitely a lot of speculative activity out there, and we would put all of those in the camp of speculative activity, and they've been driven primarily by retail investors and primarily by things like social media and other avenues that investors are looking to as alternatives to conventional advice taking. Uh, so, you know, we try not to get distracted by those. They, uh, they certainly are signs of froth and speculation, which should give you pause. But we think that the underlying fundamentals are strong enough that from a market positioning perspective, we're not um, you know, using those as uh, benchmarks to actually pull back at this stage. Laurie, thanks so much. Laurie Heinel there, State Street Global Advisors, Global Chief Investment Officer. Now, coming up, the Lazard Chief Executive, Ken Jacobs, says remote work could have a big impact on prospects for younger bankers. We'll discuss the future of the office next. This is Bloomberg. This has been an extraordinarily productive year. We haven't really missed uh, much as a result of being out of the office. I think longer term, it has big impacts on the ability to train and recruit and retain uh, the best of our people. And um, this ultimately is an in-office experience. I expect, you know, by the fall, we'll be more in the office. I like the idea of having more people back in the office, uh, especially where it's safe to do so. I think Hong Kong is one of those places where we can have more folks coming back mm. uh, in the office. Will the business go back to the way it used to be before, um, jumping on a plane, uh, as my wife used to say, just to get a coffee with a client? Probably not. JP Morgan, Asia Pacific Chief Executive Filippo Gori, and Lazard Chief Executive Ken Jacob speaking to Bloomberg about getting bankers back to the office. Now, Elisa Martinuzzi, Bloomberg opinion columnist, joins us with the latest. Elisa, um, of course, a number of challenges for a lot of these bankers, but one of them is, you know, trying to get people back into the office, and then especially if you're in Asia, also trying to get you vaccinated. We heard from HSBC offering quite a few perks to make sure that people are enticed to get the jab. Yes, I think there are quite a few things going on here. I think particularly in Hong Kong, the vaccination drive hasn't been as, as effective as, you know, as elsewhere in the world. And what we're hearing is, you know, that the financial services community being lent on by the government there to, um, you know, to, to get more of their staff vaccinated, um, which, you know, will help them back, make it back into the office, but will also clearly help with, with fighting COVID to, on the ground. Um, of course, there's also the, 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 you know, what banks would like to do longer term, and, you know, some of them, of course, as you know, have been very vocal about wanting people back into an office um, as and when appropriate. But, you know, certainly seeing the future of work in, in, a, in the building, in the office. I thought Ken Jacobs' point was really interesting because he said, look, we got all of our work done. You know, we were doing good business from home. The problem is training and retaining a new generation of talent. And for sure, we've seen young bankers really unhappy doing the same hours they would have been doing in the office but since they're doing it from home they don't have that camaraderie they're not hanging precisely i mean on the one hand they're not hanging so they're not getting sort of relief um you know at least in the in parts of the day from from the work they're also just on all the time i mean we've all experienced that 
uh, being, you know, it's slightly harder to turn off your PC when you're at home, um, working from home. But equally, you know, they're not learning as much, one assumes, from their colleagues, from the senior ranks. I mean, just being in the office and, and hearing your, your manager speak to a client, for example, um, you know, you're not necessarily um, in a training room then, but you're certainly picking up um, how to how to successfully win over a potential customer and of course you know we've all you know the ones who have been working for for many years have, have lived off that that experience and that you know our contact bases um, for a year a year a bit but you know um, ultimately it, it you know for many of these jobs it's about those connections connecting with people and you can only do that most effectively I think we can all agree in person so is that is that going to return, Eliza, post pandemic? Are banks going to start sending people on planes, go make deals, go meet in person? Or are we going to be more focused on cost savings coming out of this and realize that deals can still get done even if remotely? I think what you might end up saying is that, you know, the intention might be to be out on the road less. But the minute a competitor gets on that plane, you know, makes it to, you know, FaceTime with a customer and you lose that business, rest assured everybody else will be doing the same. Um, so I think while the intention may well be to cut back significantly, I, I do wonder whether over time um, those habits will just kick back in just because when one person does that, when one competitor um, does that, then you're sort of almost obliged to be doing the same. Are you seeing anybody you know, really quit or, or move to another business as they face the prospect of having to go back into an office and sit at a cubicle again? I think we've, you know, we've all heard those, those anecdotes and, um, you know, I think it'll be testing over the next few months as people are actually required to go back in to see how many are willing to make, to go back to the to previous lifestyles. I think, you know, I think it's early days, um, but, you know, it has been, you know, long 15 months for, for everyone. So wouldn't be surprised if, if there are more people uh, reassessing their lives and, and their careers more broadly. Elisa, thank you so much for all of the insight. Elisa Martinuzzi there from Bloomberg Opinion. She also has really some great stories, so you can subscribe to her columns on the Bloomberg Terminal. Now, coming up, more on the future of work from home with the Zoom Chief Financial Officer, at Kelly Steckelberg. That's at 5 p.m. in New York, 10 p.m. in London, and this is Bloomberg. Well, this is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lackman, London. Matt Miller in Berlin. Kaylee Lines in New York. We're now joined also by Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. And I know, Tom, you're looking not only at Fed speakers today, good morning, by the way, uh, but you're looking at economic data not only today, but then through Friday. Well, the economic data into Friday and the jobs report, boy, was it uh, interesting and a huge fail for economists last time. They just simply got it wrong. We'll see about this time. And that data really starts uh, with a vengeance today and then into tomorrow as well. The backdrop here is auto sales. One of the great things you can see, and I and I do this, Francine, I sit on Fifth Avenue with a cigar of my choice, going back and forth with Matt Miller counting the Porsches on Fifth Avenue. And the <laughs> answer is everybody's buying cars from Porsches uh, down to the Toyota Camry and the other U.S. fare, including pickup trucks. Uh, the chart's real simple. We come back, but we really come back with a vengeance and have exceeded the peak 12-month moving average that we saw a number of years ago. We are selling cars in a boom economy. Yeah, I think Miller is actually more into the Aventador than the Porsches, but I could be speaking out of term. Tom, what are you most looking forward to, to hearing from the <laughs> Fed presidents? Well, you know, the bullet yesterday made a real splash for the Financial Times, and it's something we've heard before in his conversations with Michael McKee. I think everybody's jockeying to see. The thing I would say has changed, Francine, is there was an entire theory out there three months ago that we'd have a boom and then boom, we'd come right down, right down to 2%, 3% at GDP. That has changed, and the zeitgeist now is a more gradual ebbing from a 10% boom. Yeah, Matt Miller only buys Italian cars. Tom, when you look at, you know, wh why is it so <laughs> difficult to, to forecast some of the data out of the U.S.? I know this has been, you know, the, the big problem for economists, we are, and we spent a bit of time also speaking to our Simon Kennedy it, about this. It's a, but know, is it just the shape of the recovery we're seeing? It is. We had a natural disaster. We've never faced this before. 
and you know it's a cliche but it's true we're on original territory everybody business people consumers the labor dynamics dan elpert a good friend of the show with a uh, op-ed in the uh new york times today francine scathing about low-wage jobs just scathing you see the the labor coming up finally that goes right back into consumption and all of it just very very hard to predict Tom, were you on, on like your couch yesterday trading from like Reddit? Were you into AMC or Baby Shark? No, I, 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 I've been watching it, I think, from a distance, and um, I, I really don't have any wisdom on it other than, uh, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a distraction on the side based on technology. You know? Okay, Tom, an always dapper Tom Keen, I'd like to add. A color coordinated bow tie. Tom Keen, co anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Now, this is what we're watching for the rest of the day. I mean, Tom was kind of going through its beige book and, of course, some of the Fed presidents as well, Kaylee. Yeah, well, Francine, what's going to be particularly interesting inside of the Beige Book, which, of course, gathers up all this anecdotal evidence about economic activity, is what they say about shortages, both in terms of materials and that kind of supply, and then, of course, labor. In the last Beige Book we got on April 14th, it made references to shortages 37 times, and I wonder if that number is going to be higher in today's report. And, of course, given the ISM manufacturing data we got yesterday, Matt, that was pretty strong, but, again, revealed those shortages uh, both in terms of employees and then of course supply it'll be interesting to see if the beige book kind of echoes that at 2 p.m eastern time i mean i think you're bang on um kaylee shortages we've seen so many car manufacturers close up factories mm -hmm. recently yeah. and uh labor i've talked to so many employers who say they just can't get people to come into work i always say why don't you just raise wages um but that's those two issues i think are front and center i'm watching speaking of jobs i'm watching the jbs speaking hack hackers. <laughs> when you're sitting around the dinner table with your kids and they're saying like mom what should i be when i grow up you might want to say think about being a hacker because you can make a ton of money these companies are paying out big multi-million dollar ransoms and the work is pretty easy i think the work is probably pretty easy I don't if know that. you're a little bit you still have to look over your shoulder because the fbi might be knocking on your door but you can make a lot of money <laughs> I don't, you could also end up in prison, Matt. I actually had this very <laughs> conversation with my eight-year-old who came home from school after the pipeline hack and saying, I think my friend, my friend has told me that he's hacked the pipeline. Um, I said, yeah, forget the money. You're going to end up in jail if you start talking about it, especially at eight years old. So I tried to move that conversation swiftly on. I'm going to watch Elon Musk. I mean, this is another way of making money, right? Do, 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 it's do, NFTs do, 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 and, and a catchy song that no one really <laughs> likes, but apparently everyone listens to because after that tweet saying that Baby Shark um, was more viewed than any video human, I mean, it's true. It's 8 billion people. I mean, can you even have 8 billion people that watch the same video? And the share price, I mean, I can't get over the, the fact that we're watching on Bloomberg TV, but the share price of the publisher in or the shareholder of the publisher in Baby Shark soared on the back of it. You guys, help me out. Yep, almost 10% in South Korean trading. Making Baby Shark a market moving event. Happy 2021. With the eye roll. <laughs> the shade. I don't know Matt why Miller. we do this to the viewers. It's so hard. Coming up, the viewer will be able to speak to Jennifer Lee, BMO senior economist. This is Bloomberg.